At the turn of the century, most murders went unsolved. The dead took their secrets with them to the grave. It would take years before science could understand the language of the dead. But today, the forensic pathologist has the tools to interpret their language with amazing accuracy. Now, we can enter this world, a world both fascinating and forbidden. It is the world of forensic pathology, a world where the dead reveal their secrets to the living through the mysteries of the autopsy. The following film is based on the case files of medical examiners throughout the country. These are the stories behind some of their most provocative cases. Early on a cold spring morning in 1983, two fishermen spotted a strange object floating in the Mississippi River. At first, they thought it was the body of an animal caught in the undertow of the river and washed ashore. But as they got closer, they saw it had a more familiar shape. They realized that they were looking at part of a human body. Horrified at their discovery, the fishermen called police. Lieutenant Ted Carroll was the first to arrive. I proceeded to the scene. The torso was still in the river at this point. With a boat, we got the torso over to the bank and out of the water. We placed it in a body bag and had the ambulance take it to Mercy Hospital so we could perform an autopsy on it. The torso, which measured only 18 inches, was taken to the Davenport morgue to be autopsied. Photographs and x-rays were taken in hopes of finding other clues to the victim's identity. But the autopsy report could only give the police limited information. They could tell us that it was a white female. She had had at least one child because she had an episiotomy scar. In the pathologist's opinion, the body had been dismembered with a chainsaw, and that was due to the cuts on the body and part of the intestine had caught in the blade and wrapped around the torso. We're talking about a lady's pelvis and part of a leg. That's it. The features that you would look for to identify this body and what that you would normally have in an investigation are gone. You don't have hands, you don't have uh, feet, you don't have dental records because you're, you're missing a skull. Uh, you don't have the entire body to be able to estimate uh, height. You're not really sure just exactly how she died. You know, we weren't sure just exactly how this lady died. We knew that she had been dismembered, but what happened before the dismemberment? Police searched the marshlands and small islands up and down the Mississippi, hoping to find other body parts to help identify the victim. Being familiar with the Mississippi River, I wasn't at all confident that other parts were going to show up. Uh, there have been a number of cases where nothing shows up out of that river. A human body goes in the river, it's in there very long. Uh, fish and turtles get to it. After days of searching the marshlands of the Mississippi, the police found nothing. And the task of identifying the torso seemed more difficult than ever. As the news grew, on what we found, we started getting reports from further and further away, inquiries as to could this be their missing lady from other jurisdictions. The FBI computer database of missing persons indicated there were 79 women missing from the state of Iowa, and the torso could have been any one of them. To narrow the search, Lieutenant Kern and Lieutenant Carroll packed the torso in ice and drove to Oklahoma City to see Dr. Clyde Snow, 
a specialist in the study of bones. When I first looked at the torso, I wanted to find out as much as I could about this individual in terms of the uh, basic descriptors of sex, age, height, body build. There's a wealth of detail and information that we can derive from studying the bones themselves that we can't even see from x-rays. Dr. Snow proceeded to deflesh the torso by soaking it in a concentration of hydrogen peroxide. After 10 hours, what remained were just the pelvic bones and the upper femurs. From these few bones, Dr. Snow began to build a portrait of the missing woman. One of the best indicators of age in adults is this pubic symphysis, which is the joint that's made where the, where the two hip bones come together in front in the pelvis. And the surface of that joint undergoes some pretty regular changes with age. And by looking at those features, we can generally estimate age within plus or minus uh, five to 10 years. Dr. Snow used the fragmented thigh bone to determine the victim's height. And in this case, it was complicated by the fact that we didn't have the complete bones. We only had portions of these upper femurs, but we still have formulas that enable us to get fairly reasonable height estimates, even from fragments. Dr. Snow, using little more than a portion of female pelvis, came up with some remarkable conclusions. Basically, based on my examination, I could say that this person was a white female who was about 28 to 40 years of age at the time of her death. She was about five foot three, plus or minus, say three inches in height, around 125 to 145 pounds in weight. And those same pelvic bones showed some features that indicated that she was uh, in an active exercise program, did a lot of sit-ups. She had been uh, dismembered or uh, with a saw, fairly heavy-bladed saw, and there were some indications that the person who did the dismemberment had some basic anatomical knowledge. Of the 79 women missing in the state of Iowa, only one fit Dr. Snow's description. She was a 33-year-old housewife named Joyce Clint. At five feet, five inches in height, weighing 128 pounds, she was a perfect match in age, height, and weight. She was also known to exercise strenuously and was married to one of the most prominent chiropractors in the area. After 13 years of marriage, she and her husband James had been going through a stormy divorce. Her husband said she had taken off one morning, and neither he nor their 13-year-old son had heard from her since. A week before her torso was found, Jim Clint had gone on television asking for help to find his missing wife. Wherever she's at, uh, it would be nice if she'd contact her son. How do you feel about the whole thing? Has it been hard on you and your son? Or? It's disrupted our life. Uh, in a separation or a divorce, we would have probably been able to get back to a normal life a lot quicker without this type of separation. But if she can hear this or if she's watching, I just call Bart. That's the main thing. Just let him know. Once he knows, then everybody would be happy, I'm sure. But the police did not buy his story. There was growing evidence that James Clint was somehow involved with the murder of his wife. Joyce, knowing the impending divorce was coming, wanted some of the things he was telling her on tape, so she hid a tape recorder. And on this tape recording, Jim uh, threatened to cut her up in little pieces. On March 28, 1984, one year after the discovery of the torso, Jim Clint was arrested for the murder of his wife. At his trial, the jury, as well as Jim Clint, listened to the tape his wife had made 
just a day before she had disappeared. The only reason I was lying, why was that? Why was that lying? I was trying to kill me a few weeks ago, stuffing my head down the bed, holding my head you. down. Yeah, I was trying to show you how much I didn't want you to get water. Oh, you hurt me. You had my head down the covers and told me you were going to cut me up in little pieces and I was going to die. From the tape, the jury learned that the couple had battled over finances and the custody of their son. Why were you doing this to me? Because I hate you. When Jim Clint's mistress, Terry Kane, took the stand, the jury also learned that he had promised to divorce his wife and marry her. What did he tell you? That Joyce wanted to try a separation. And what did you say? I grabbed him and hugged him, and I thought it was wonderful. Jim Clint freely admitted to having marital problems, but said not only was he not guilty, but he insisted that the torso was not his wife. But Dr. Snow's testimony and the forensic evidence convinced the jury otherwise. We, the jury, find the defendant, James B. Clint, guilty of the crime of murder in the second degree. Jim Clint was stunned by the verdict. He thought he had gotten away with a perfect murder. Instead, he was facing the rest of his life in prison. Nearly two years after her death, Joyce's fragmented remains were finally laid to rest in Davenport's Memorial Cemetery. Even though nothing more was ever found of Joyce Clint, through forensic science, she had spoken from the grave, convicting the man who had killed her. Seven years later, Jim Clint would finally confess to the murder of his wife. In 1985, on a sweltering summer day in New York, police were called to an apartment house to investigate a homicide. As they walked into the disheveled apartment, they were confronted with the unmistakable smell of death. The vile odor led them to the bathroom, where they saw a tub filled with water, crawling with maggots. Underneath the maggots, they could just make out all that was left of the woman who had lived there. Police called forensic pathologist Dr. Michael Bodden. When I walked into the bathroom, it was stifling hot, a strong odor of decomposition and ammonia, and there were flies all over the place, and a skeletonized body in the bathtub with thousands of maggots on the surface of the water. There was no tissue, no tissue to do toxicology. So what I did is I took a jar and gathered in a lot of the maggots from the bathtub that had been feeding on this woman. I went right over to the toxicologist and I said, explain the situation, no tissues to do toxicology. Uh, this woman could have been murdered, could have died a natural death, we don't know. Um, could he process the maggots? He reluctantly agreed to appease me to put the maggots in the blender. And then we got the thick, soupy liquid out, and he tested it. Voila, it was loaded with barbiturates. We had a cause of death. The woman who had lived in this room alone and despondent had taken her own life by an overdose of sleeping pills. Police said later, if it hadn't been for the maggots, the case would never have been solved. Like most normal people, I was disgusted by maggots when I first started as a medical examiner. But very quickly, we get to appreciate how much help they can give to us. They tell us how long somebody's been dead. They can tell us that somebody's been poisoned. They can tell us where a gunshot wound is or a stab wound is. They're the last witnesses to death. To the forensic pathologist, the evidence found at the crime scene can reveal how, or when, or why someone has died. But the reason someone kills can often remain a mystery.
On April 11, 1977, in a small church in El Dorado, Illinois, funeral services were held for a 21-year-old boy named Mark Cavanis. The people in town who had watched young Mark grow up were now stunned by the violence of his death. Just two days before, Mark's body, partially devoured by animals, was found on his father's farm. When I arrived at the scene, the only remaining parts from the body was from mid-thigh down. The rest of the body parts had been removed by various animals and varmints and so forth that had been in the area. The body was in such bad condition that the only thing the police could determine was that Mark had been shot through the heart. Police theorized that when Mark had gotten out of his truck, he had grabbed his shotgun by the muzzle. It caught on a wire hanger and went off accidentally, shooting him in the chest. But Detective Jack Nolan had a different theory. At the time of the investigation, from the very beginning, I felt that, that it was a homicide, but that the weapon had been rigged to make it look like a possible accidental shooting or, or a possible suicide. Most people accepted the conclusion that Mark had been killed by accident. After all, he had always seemed to be a happy boy who had come from a loving family. His father, Dr. Dale Cavanis, who had been the town doctor for more than 20 years, seemed to be the ideal father. Why would a boy who had everything to live for want to commit suicide? As time passed, the story slowly disappeared from the local headlines. Everyone wanted to forget the tragedy of Mark's death. No one thought it could happen again. But seven years later, on a lonely country road, 40 miles outside of St. Louis, the body of Mark's younger brother, Sean, was found shot to death. Police found no clues and no eyewitnesses. While Sean's body was being brought to the morgue to be autopsied, police called his brother, Kevin. I said, your brother, Sean Cavanis, has been murdered. I need you or someone from your family to come identify the body. And after making positive identification, the first words out of his mouth was, I can't believe this. This is my second brother that I've had killed. I was saying, how in the world can, can a normal family, who seems like they have everything going for them, have two brothers killed and both of the circumstances being so much alike. Sergeant Barron got his first break when neighbors said they had seen Sean and his father leave his house at 1.30 that morning, less than five hours before Sean was murdered. I remember going back to the office and telling my sergeant at the time, I said, I think I have a suspect. He said, who is it? I said, it's his dad. He looks at me, and I remember he had something in his hand and kind of tossed it. He goes, his dad's a doctor. I go, I know. He says, are you trying to tell me that a doctor killed his own son? I said, yeah, that's what I'm trying to tell you. Hoping to catch Dr. Cavanis in a lie, Sergeant Barron drove out to his house to question him. You remember looking at him across the kitchen table like, well, doctor? I said, when was the last time you were seen, Sean? He looked back, and my heart was just pounding. And he goes, about four or five weeks ago. Sergeant Barron told Dr. Cavanis that he knew his story was a lie, and he had eyewitnesses to prove it. I said, only two people know really what happened that night. I said, Sean can't tell me, but you can. Finally, after about two hours and 25 minutes, he says, all right, you're right. I was in St. Louis that night, and I did see Sean but I didn't kill him. The doctor explained that that evening, he and his son had gone for a long drive in the country and had pulled over by the side of the road. The doctor said he was transferring some soda from the front seat of his car to the trunk when he heard Sean say, tell mom I'm sorry, and he heard a gunshot go off. He looked up in time to see Sean crumble to the ground. Dr. Cavanaugh said when he realized his son had killed himself, a feeling of disbelief paralyzed him for a few seconds. He said, I thought for a minute, he says, I thought how his mother would be hurt so much that Sean killed himself. So I took the gun out of his hand. I stepped back about four or five feet, and I shot one more time. 
Dr. Cavanus's story seemed plausible, but the ballistic evidence found at the autopsy proved that Sean had not committed suicide because the first shot fired and the one that killed him had come from behind. My findings were that the gunshot wound applied to the back of the neck was a close range shot, not several feet away, and that the bullet exited from near the left eye. The fact that there was blood on the left shoulder and left arm uh, indicate that in all probability he was standing at the time with his arm slightly raised. That could account for the deposition of blood on the shirt and on the forearm. Had he been shot while lying down, it is almost impossible for the blood to have splattered in that position. Dr. Turgeon had proven that Sean was standing when his father came up from behind and shot him, execution style, in the back of the head. It appeared that this had to be, in my opinion, premeditated. And this is what's difficult for me to understand. Not that he's a physician, but a father killing his own child. On December 19, 1984, Dr. Cavanus was arrested for murder in the first degree. Kevin, I said, it's your dad. We've arrested your dad for this. And he took his, he pounded his fist, and he goes, I bet you that dirty bastard killed Mark, too. When the case went to trial, the forensic evidence convinced the jury that Dr. Kavanagh had murdered his son. The motive? Money. He had made a series of bad investments. On the verge of bankruptcy, he had insured each of his sons for $100,000. Although Dr. Cavanis never admitted to killing his sons, Mark and Sean, after two years on death row, he took his own life. Guards found him in his cell, hanging from an extension cord. Nowhere in his suicide note did he mention his family. The marshlands off the New Jersey shore are dense with reeds that often contain unexpected surprises. It was here that a man was searching for driftwood when he came upon an old plastic bag that contained what looked like animal bones. The skull and feet were missing. Only the rib cage had remained intact. The police come, take the bag, and they bring it over to the local veterinarian, thinking they're animal bones. The veterinarian opens it up, looks at the bones, and says, hey, wait a second. These aren't animal bones. These are human bones. So police gather it together, and the next stop is the medical examiner's office. The medical examiner, Dr. Gita Natarajan, looks at them and confirms that they're human bones, and she's able to tell that the bones from a young woman um, who's probably been dead for a year or two, and notices the edges of the long bones aren't broken, but they've been cut through by a saw. And from her experience and the marks, the tool marks on the edges of the bones, determines that's a hacksaw that's been used to cut through the bones. So she advised the police, you know, we might have a homicide on our hands. Could they please go back to where they found the bones and get everything that was at the scene, all the other bones that are missing if they could, and anything else, clothing, anything they could find. So a couple of days later, the police come back with a couple of big bags of materials that they found at the scene, branches and leaves and a few bones. And they said, Doc, we even found some jellyfish. First, she's able to determine that the jellyfish aren't jellyfish, but are two plastic breast implants, which she cleans off and finds these are all numbered by the manufacturer. The police were able to trace back the implant number to a woman named Kieran Carter. She, it turned out, had been involved with a gang of burglars, and she was strangled to death, was dumped over the Margate Bridge with the idea that it'd be washed out to the ocean. But instead, it got washed into the marshy area. And it stayed there for a year and a half 
decomposing until someone looking for driftwood found the bag and reported to the police. If she hadn't had those breast implants, her murders might never have been identified. On a warm summer's day in 1987, police were ordered to exhume 10 bodies from various cemeteries throughout Cincinnati. All the bodies had two things in common. They had all been patients at the same hospital, and they had all been cared for by a gentle nurse's aide named Donald Harvey. In room 486 at Drake Hospital, a 44-year-old patient by the name of John Powell, after having barely survived a motorcycle accident, lay unconscious in a darkened room. The only sound came from the machines monitoring his vital signs. I talked with him every day. That, I felt that was very important. I had always heard that, to talk to someone. So I kept giving him reassurance and encouragement. John Powell had everything to live for. He and his wife, Patricia, were happily married with three children until a car sideswiped his motorcycle, catapulting him onto a cement causeway where he struck his head. It was a blow that almost ended his life. But now, after months of drifting in and out of consciousness, John Powell began to show definite signs of improvement. There was more progress all the time. To me, I felt the Lord was with him all the way because he would smile, have a sense of humor, you know, if we'd joke with him or um, I'd tell him that he was looking good. But the first time I saw him smile was when Donald Harvey had woke him up and said, hey, John, wake up. Your better half is here. And at that point, my husband smiled. And he smiled a lot after that. But on the evening of March 7th, 1987, without any warning, John Powell suddenly stopped breathing. I got a, a call in the morning, and he said that John had just died, and I, I I believe I was in a state of shock. Doctors believed John Powell had died of complications due to pneumonia. But Powell had been injured in a motorcycle accident, and under state law, any accident victim had to be autopsied. One day later, forensic pathologist Dr. Lee Lehman began a routine autopsy on the body of John Powell. The autopsy began just like any other. The body was examined for any unnatural markings. Samples of the blood were taken. The organs were weighed and measured. Near the end of the autopsy, Dr. Lehman opened the stomach. All of a sudden, he was surprised by an unusual odor, like that of burnt almonds. Even though he had never encountered it before at autopsy, Dr. Lehman recognized that odor immediately. It was the lethal smell of cyanide. The toxicology report confirmed what Dr. Lehman had found. Someone at Drake Hospital had murdered John Powell with a massive dose of cyanide. John Powell had approximately 10 times the minimum amount to kill a, an adult person in his body. And the minimum dose being 200 milligrams, we would estimate that he had about two grams of cyanide given to him. Cyanide is a respiratory poison. It's uh, a chemical suffocation. It stops the uh, 
the body from using oxygen. The brain is particularly sensitive to lack of oxygen and the brain dies very rapidly. The heart may be for a considerable time after there's complete uh, absence of brain activity. But uh, without oxygen for about 10 minutes, the brain is completely dead. The Cincinnati police began a widespread investigation. Everyone on John Powell's ward was submitted to lie detector tests. One nurse's aide, named Donald Harvey, from the beginning seemed suspiciously nervous and refused to participate. Donald Harvey did not show up on several occasions. He was the last one of the whole list that we were having a problem with. We felt at that time he was a little bit more eccentric than some of the other people that we had talked to. The more we talked to him, my partner and I felt that uh, Donald was hiding something from us. After eight hours of intense questioning, Harvey finally confessed to the murder of John Powell. I just took a little tube of cyanide and put it in his two feet bag. The amount that you put in would be a, a lethal dose? It was enough to kill an army. The next morning, Harvey was taken to the detention center of Cincinnati to await his trial for the murder of John Powell. The case seemed to be closed, but that wasn't the end of the story. His attorney came into the office into the prosecutor's office and said, my client killed a lot of people at Drake Hospital and is willing to confess to all he has done, all the people he has killed, but you cannot seek the death penalty. The next morning, Donald Harvey began a series of confessions to law enforcement officials. It was a terrifying look into the mind of a psychopath. Just took a coat hanger, straightened it out, put it in the catheter, and put it up inside of his penis and threw the bladder. I pushed the catheter in, and when I pushed the catheter in, there was blood, you know, come out through the catheter. And he sat up on the bed, and at the time he sat up on the bed, he vomited blood down my back, onto my shoes, and he was gone. I carried him in, and I hooked him up to an empty tank, and he was pronounced dead. After 13 long hours of confession, Harvey's death list had reached the incredible number of 39 victims. Donald Harvey was delving into what I would term torture and murder. He never was seen by anyone doing anything. Um, and he used poison almost always, which was untraceable. So when you have that set of factors along with his compulsion, it's obviously a deadly combination, but it's an effective one for a serial killer because he can stay undetected for a long period of time and continue to kill. Donald Harvey, the man police call the angel of death, was given 28 life sentences. No one knows exactly how many people Harvey killed, but estimates run as high as 57 making him one of the most deadly serial killers who has ever lived. Each year around the country, college football becomes a showcase for up-and-coming young football players. In California in 1981, Fans were getting excited about a player named Ron Settles, a 21-year-old running back for Long Beach State. He had been scouted by several pro teams and seemed to have a bright future in professional football. But on the morning of June 2, 1981, Ron Settles was driving through the small Los Angeles enclave known as Signal Hill when he was pulled over by police for speeding. Police said the 21-year-old football player refused to cooperate and became violent, threatening them with a nine-inch butcher knife. Settles was taken to the Signal Hill Police Department, where he was charged with assaulting a police officer with a deadly weapon and possession of cocaine. After being fingerprinted, he was taken to a holding cell to await arraignment. 
40 minutes after a routine cell check, he was found dead, hanging from a mattress cover. Police said he had committed suicide. But a young man about to sign a contract with a professional football team seemed an unlikely candidate for suicide. However, the autopsy report stated that Ron Settle's death was due to a suicidal hanging. The Settle's family thought the official version of his death was just a cover-up for murder. They demanded that his body be re-autopsied by an independent medical examiner. One year later, in 1982, Ron Settle's body was exhumed from his burial place in Tennessee and sent to the Suffolk County Medical Examiner's Office in New York. The Settle's family hoped that the re-autopsy would resolve the question for them once and for all. Did their son commit suicide or was he murdered? When we autopsied the body, there was no furrow and no groove around the neck as I would expect to be present in somebody who'd been hanging for the length of time that it takes rigor mortis to be found as was found here. What I did find were things that you usually don't find in hangings but you do find in chokeholds. Little red punctate hemorrhages in the whites of the eye, small bruise on the skin on the outside and a lot more hemorrhages underneath the skin and around the voice box, and especially one in the back of the esophagus. Dr. Bodden had come to the conclusion that Ron Settles had died as a result of a chokehold, one that is used by many police departments to subdue violent prisoners. The brain only has about a 10 or 15 second supply of oxygen normally. So if the carotid arteries are both squeezed at the same time, a violent person will pass out within 10 or 15 seconds as soon as the oxygen in the brain is used up. And so this is a way of controlling somebody very rapidly. Now the problem with that is if the pressure is, is uh, left on too long, the brain is very sensitive to lack of oxygen and with, within 30 seconds or a minute there can be permanent brain, brain damage and even death. And in this instance, in my opinion, I think the overwhelming evidence here is that it was not suicidal hanging. In 1981, a coroner's inquest had been held at the Superior Court of California. We find this death to have been at the hands of another. The jury found that Ron Settles had not committed suicide, but in their words, he had died at the hands of another, other than by accident. Although the city of Signal Hill settled the family's civil lawsuit for $1 million, no one was ever brought to trial for the death of Ron Settles. The medical examiner must interpret the voices of those who can no longer speak. This responsibility is greatest when the voice he must listen to and understand is that of a child. Lois Jurgens was an attractive 34-year-old housewife who had come from a large family of 16 brothers and sisters. But she and her husband, Harold, had tried, without success, to have children of their own. Finally, after 16 frustrating years, they adopted a little boy they named Robert. Three years later, they adopted a second child they named Dennis. For two and a half years, Dennis and Robert were as close as any brothers could be. But their lives soon took a tragic turn. On a stormy night in 1965, something suddenly awoke five-year-old Robert Jurgens. I remember waking up, hearing uh, loud screams. I went uh, to Dennis's bedroom. I saw Lois uh, picking Dennis up out of his crib. She kept yelling his name, Dennis, Dennis, Dennis. Uh, his arms were limp, um, like a dish towel. He, he was just uh, swaggering, his arms and his legs. 
and, and something was wrong, and his, and his head was moving back and forth, uh, uncontrollable. Two days later, three-and-a-half-year-old Dennis Jurgens was laid to rest. The official explanation was that Dennis had been injured in a fall and had died of peritonitis, an infection of the lower bowel. For 15 years, little Dennis lay in St. Mary's Cemetery, the cause of his death unquestioned, until his biological mother decided to search for her son. Fifteen years before, Jerry Sherwood had become pregnant with Dennis while she was a teenager living in a home for delinquent girls. Being a ward of the state, she was forced to give up her son for adoption. Even though Jerry Sherwood eventually married and had four more children, she never forgot the baby that the state had taken away from her. I called Scott County Welfare Department. Approximately six weeks later, I get a letter in the mail. Sorry to inform you, uh, Dennis Craig Jurgens uh, died April 11th, 1965, of peritonitis. Sincerely. Now that Jerry had found out that Dennis had died, she wanted to say goodbye to the son she barely knew. She decided to go to the mortuary where Dennis's funeral had taken place. Here, she not only found her son's burial records, but also old, faded newspaper clippings. One sentence in particular caught her eye. There was a little newspaper article that said uh, Dennis Craig Jurgens was found in his crib and his body bore multiple bruises and injuries. And the first thing I did was I looked at my friend and, and my daughter, my son, I said, my son was beaten to death. I just, I knew it, I felt it. Jerry Sherwood became obsessed with finding out what happened to Dennis. She enlisted the help of her 18-year-old son. I had told my son, I said, it's what I want you to do is I want you to go to the library. I want you to go back. I want you to get everything you can get. Because it said in that first article I saw that the coroner was investigating. So I figured there would be other things in the paper. There wasn't. My son could find only that one article. And I said, while you're doing that, I'm going to make some phone calls. It was her phone call to the medical examiner's office in Ramsey County that would trigger the official investigation into the death of Dennis Jurgens. The first time I heard the name Dennis Jurgens was when a lady by the name of Jerry Sherwood came into our office and said that she was investigating her son's death and wished to know how he had died in Ramsey County in 1965. Dr. McGee obtained the official records of the first autopsy. To his surprise, the file contained photographs that were both shocking and revealing. You have a little boy laying on an autopsy table. It's completely nude, and he's just covered with bruises. His face is covered with them. He has a large bruise in his forehead region. His abdomen is distended. I said, well, this is a homicide. And I, I said, you know, oh, I, we need to find out what's going on. In order to confirm Dr. McGee's conclusions, authorities exhumed the body of Dennis Jurgens. When they opened the casket, to everyone's surprise, after lying in the ground for more than 20 years, the body was remarkably well preserved. There was no human explanation for why he was so well preserved. You could see the fingernail marks behind his ears, and there was a kind of a purple spot at the tip of his penis. And one of the medical examiners that we, we worked with on this case said, you know, if I was a betting man, I'd say that was a bite mark, which pretty much stopped us in our tracks. Dr. McGee examined the mummified remains of Dennis Jurgens, hoping to find the specific injury that had caused his death. I worked straight through the day and into the evening hours. And about 2.30 in the morning of the following morning, I had found the bowel. And in the mid portion of the bowel, there is a defect present. That was the defect that caused the bowel to spill contents into his cavity and the cause of death in the child. Dr. McGee concluded that the injury that had killed Dennis Jurgens could not have been caused by accident. Children can certainly fall down and receive injuries. There's no question about that. But Dennis's injuries, you must understand, were delivered to deep set organs inside of his body, the bowel. The injuries we're talking about requires tremendous energy. 
And aside from automobile accidents or accidents of that nature, a child simply cannot generate that much energy just falling down the stairs or slipping on a wet bathroom floor. The prosecutors were now convinced that Lois Jurgens had tortured and beaten her adopted son to death. We don't know how she, what the mechanism of her killing him was. She either had to punch him in the stomach, e either with her hand or with an object with his back up against a hard surface like a, a floor or a wall in order to, to push that ball into his spine and tear it, or she had to kick him or, or do something, but he had to be on a flat surface and there had to be some force doing it. And the doctors told us that force was train wreck force. In 1987, at the Supreme Court in Minnesota, Lois Jurgens, now 62 years old, was brought to trial for the murder of her adopted son. In attendance was Jerry Sherwood. Robert Jurgens, now a young man of 27, came to testify against his mother. He took the stand and described what it was like growing up as a five-year-old in the Jurgens' home. She'd pull your ears, she'd whip you with a belt or a cedar board, and on, uh, on one occasion uh, that I recall, her grabbing Dennis by the back of the ears and uh, forcefully submerged his head under the water. And I remember him gasping as he would come up for air and, and crying. To Robert, the autopsy photographs shown in court of his younger brother were not a surprise. When I viewed those morgue photos, that is how I remember seeing Dennis all the time. So it wasn't a real shock to me. That's how I saw Dennis. Based on the forensic evidence and Robert Jurgens' testimony, Lois Jurgens was found guilty of murder in the third degree. For Jerry Sherwood, her six-year search for justice was finally over. In 1976, one of the strangest incidents in forensic science took place in Pike's Amusement Park in Long Beach, California. A film crew who had come to shoot a film in a funhouse soon discovered that one of the exhibits was not what it seemed to be. They had come across a thin figure hanging from a rope. When a crew member tried to move it, the mannequin's arm came off in his hands. Sticking out of the elbow was a human bone. When the pathologist unclothed the mummy, he found a figure covered in wax and red paint. It was as hard as stone, so petrified that the pathologist needed a chisel to cut through it. By the end of the autopsy, there was no doubt. The mummy hanging in the funhouse was a human being. Historians believed that the mummy was an outlaw named Elmer McCurdy, shot in a gunfight in 1911. Using a technique called medial superimposition, scientists compared his picture taken at the time of his death and the skull of the funhouse mummy. They matched perfectly. After 60 years, Elmer McCurdy was no longer just an anonymous sideshow attraction in a house of horrors. Forensic science had given him a name and a face. Over 7,000 miles away, another more ancient human being 
was found buried beneath the earth. From his blackened bones, forensic scientists could tell a great deal about the boy king, whose history was clouded by myth. By examining his wisdom teeth, they could determine that he had died at the age of 18, probably as a result of a blow to the back of his head. Blood tests linked him to the royal family of Egypt. Forensic scientists reconstructed the mummy's face. Slowly, the face of a man who had lived 3,000 years ago emerged. And we could look into the eyes of the 18-year-old boy king, Tutankhamun. Through forensic science, an ancient king and a notorious outlaw had both told their stories. Whether death occurred yesterday or 3,000 years ago, the dead's long, silent voices return to answer the questions put to them by the forensic pathologist. For him, death is not the end of the story, but just the beginning.